Good afternoon, or maybe it's still good morning uh, for you. My name is Buzz Thompson. I'm very sorry that I'm not able to actually be with you in person, but I'm very pleased to be able to participate uh, in this conference. As hopefully somebody has told you, I'm right now in Central America on work, and I just was not able to arrange it to be back in time. But I do hope I'll be able to answer questions that you might have by telephone at the end of this presentation and the panel's comments. Because I'm not able to actually be there, I thought I would choose a nice location for the shooting of this video. So I'm here at Stanford's Jasper Ridge Reserve near San Francisco Creek, because what we're gonna be talking about in this panel is water and water management in the United States. My paper has two basic propositions. The first of the propositions is that in order to solve the major challenges that we face in the water field in the United States, we have to have much more integrated water management than we've had in the past. The second of those propositions is that borrowing from the model of the Coastal Zone Management Act, the federal government can play an incredibly important role in both encouraging and enabling that greater integration of water management. I want to start out by just giving you a sense of some of the types of fragmentation that plague the water field at the moment. There are two basic types of fragmentation, substantive fragmentation, geographical fragmentation. I'll give you three examples of substantive fragmentation. The first is the fragmentation between groundwater and surface water. Groundwater and surface water are the same resource. They're hydrologically interconnected. But for years, our law and many of our institutions have treated groundwater and surface water separately. In many states, we still don't integrate surface water and groundwater at a statewide level. When somebody pumps groundwater, that can impact the amount of surface water that's available. If we overdraft a groundwater aquifer, that can actually reduce the amount of water available for surface water users. It can also rob groundwater dependent ecosystems of the water that they need to support the wildlife that live in those habitats. And yet again, even though groundwater and surface water are hydrologically interconnected, legally they're frequently fragmented. A second example is the interconnection between land use and water supply. It's probably an obvious point that land use can impact the demand for water. As cities grow, they need more water. But also the way in which we permit cities and other areas to grow can impact the supply of water. The amount of impervious surfaces has actually grown faster than city populations. And as those impervious surfaces have grown, they can have impacts on water supplies. So there was a study, for example, in 2002, which found that as impervious surfaces have increased, the amount of groundwater recharge has decreased. That study found that the amount of impervious surfaces that have increased in Seattle has actually decreased groundwater recharge by enough to actually service over half a million people on a yearly basis. The third example of substantive fragmentation is in our urban areas, the fragmentation between the water suppliers on the one hand and the wastewater disposers on the other. We have a real opportunity in our urban areas of taking wastewater, recycling it, and then reutilizing it for water supplies. But unfortunately, in many urban areas, the water suppliers are different entities than the wastewater disposers, which makes it just that much more difficult to begin to use that wastewater as a source of water supply. Compounding this problem of substantive fragmentation is geographic fragmentation. You can take a watershed, like the small watershed that provides water for the San Francisco Creek, and you will frequently find scores of different local agencies responsible for one or another aspect of water management. Just for the small watershed here for San Francisco Creek, I count nine different local agencies. In the Santa Ana watershed in Southern California, there are about a hundred different local agencies. And this gets compounded over and over again throughout the United States. To get a sense of what happens when you combine the substantive fragmentation and the geographic fragmentation, all you have to do is to take a look at a major watershed such as the San Francisco Bay Delta 
which is an area which, as you probably know, has seen great controversy over the uh, last 20 or 30 years. This is an area which faces many environmental challenges. Most of the focus has been on trying to protect the listed species in the delta. And the solution that people have focused on is trying to reduce water supplies to Southern California. But the truth of the matter is the Delta suffers not only from water diversions, but it also suffers from contaminated flows of water. It suffers from overfishing in the Pacific Ocean, which impacts the fish uh, in the Delta. It suffers from invasive uh, species, and it suffers from habitat degradation. All of those various issues are handled by different agencies, and frequently you have agencies at the federal level, the state level, the regional level, and the local level with authority over various aspects of those problems. So to try to solve the entire delta, you have to figure out a way of bringing all of those various entities together to manage it. So when I first started looking at the idea of integrated water management, one of the things that struck me was that the fragmentation that we have in the water field today looks very much like the fragmentation that we had in coastal management in the 1960s. In 1969, the Stratton Commission, a federal commission that Lyndon Johnson had formed, issued a report that said that we were never going to be managing our coasts effectively unless we had the states manage them on an integrated basis. There were simply too many agencies responsible for managing our coasts, and local agencies frequently did not have the authority needed to actually manage the coasts on an effective basis. So in response to this criticism, Congress passed the Coastal Zone Management Act. Coastal Zone Management Act was unlike many other pieces of environmental legislation in the early 1970s. First thing was that the federal government didn't decide it was going to manage the coast. Second of all, it didn't even demand that the states manage their coast. Instead, it did two things. First of all, it encouraged the states to manage the coast on an integrated basis. And it did that by providing a variety of incentives, including matching funds and also technical support. But the second thing it did was it helped enable state integrated management of the coast by agreeing that if the states came up with coastal management plans, that the federal government would act consistent with those plans. That was necessary for state coastal management plans because if the federal government didn't comply with them, then they really wouldn't be integrated coastal plans. And second of all, it was another way of encouraging states to come up with these coastal management plans because they knew that if they did, the federal government would need to comply with them. And whether it's because of that enabling aspect of the Coastal Zone Management Act or the incentives, or simply because the Coastal Zone Management Act put the attention on the importance of having statewide coastal management plans, the 35 states that have coasts in the United States all actually ultimately adopted coastal plans in response to the Coastal Zone Management Plan, although one of them, Alaska, actually backed out of its plan in 2011. So just like the federal government had strong reasons for passing the Coastal Zone Management Act, there are also a variety of reasons why the federal government not only can play a useful role here, but actually should be playing an important role. First of all, the federal government has a lot of different agencies working in the water field. And so unless the federal government is part of this integrated management effort, then integrated management is not gonna work. Second of all, the federal government has a direct interest in making sure that we have effective state management. Federal government has federal reserve water rights and a variety of activities that the federal government is involved in. For example, the production of energy are areas that the federal government needs water for. So the federal government has a reason why it should want better management, which as I mentioned earlier, requires more integration than we've had in the past. Third of all, to the degree that a state does not have effective management, it can affect its neighbors. 95% of all of the water in the United States actually derives from interstate rivers or interstate aquifers. And so if one state does not manage it effectively, it can affect its neighboring state. 
In addition to that, if one state runs out of water for any reason, it frequently looks to its neighbors for some additional water to help bolster its water needs. And third of all, because virtually all business requires water, effective management of water is also very important for interstate commerce. So borrowing then from the Coastal Zone Management Act, recognizing the importance of integrated management, my paper suggests that Congress might want to consider a Sustainable Water Integrated Management Act, what I've called SWIM, because of course all acts need a good acronym. So SWIM, just like the uh, Coastal Zone Management Act, would not require states to engage in integrated water management. It certainly would not actually have the federal government develop integrated water management. Instead, it would both enable and encourage the states to engage in more integrated water management. So take the enabling part of it first. Just like in the coastal area, there are a lot of federal agencies involved in water management. And so if integrated water management is actually to be effective, then the federal government has to be part of it. So under SWIM, the states would be required in developing integrated water management plans to involve the federal government. Once a integrated water management plan is developed for a state, it would be reviewed by a federal agency, most likely the Department of the Interior. And if it met the various criteria of the act, then all federal agencies would act consistently with that state plan. Because again, if the federal government isn't acting consistently with that, then we're not going to have truly integrated management. Second of all, SWIM would provide the states with a variety of incentives to encourage them to actually engage in integrated management. Integrated management can be complex, it can be costly, changes the status quo. All of that means that states will sometimes be reluctant to engage in integrated management. By providing incentives, Congress can actually encourage the states to engage in that management. And I think Congress has a variety of ways in which it could provide useful incentives. First incentive is funding. Of course, with budgetary concerns today, there's much less funding that might be available. But Congress could consider actually giving states that engage in integrated water management a priority in various types of conservation funding that's currently available to those states. Because to the degree that states engage in integrated water management, those states are more likely to actually achieve various other conservation goals. Second of all, as I mentioned a moment ago, the federal government would agree to act consistently with those state plans. For many states, that's going to be an important incentive. Third, the federal government could provide technical assistance to the states. Developing integrated plans can sometimes be technically difficult, and so those states that might not have the technical capabilities that the United States has, for example, through the U.S. Geological Service, could really benefit from that type of technical assistance. Fourth of all, many of the integrated plans might have elements of those plans for actually restoring, for example, part of a watershed. And so a fourth incentive would be an agreement that to the degree an integrated plan has a uh, restoration project that requires federal approval, that there could be some type of expedited or simplified federal approval of those particular projects. Perhaps the most controversial incentive that Congress could provide would be to delegate regulatory authority to the states. Actually, Congress already delegates regulatory authority in some areas to the states, but that delegation is incomplete. So Congress might consider adding a provision to SWIM that if an integrated state water management plan actually provided the functional equivalent of a federal regulatory protection, that the federal government would then delegate its authority to the state. So for example, if you had a integrated state water plan that provided protections to endangered and threatened fish species, the federal government could think about delegating that federal authority under the Endangered Species Act to the states in recognition that that state plan is providing the functional equivalent of what the Endangered Species Act would otherwise provide. That would be 
very attractive to many states, and it again would avoid duplication. Again, just to summarize, basic propositions behind this paper is that if we want to manage creeks like the San Francisco Creek that you see in the background here more effectively in the future, we have to move towards more integrated water management in the United States. The federal government can play an important, in fact, I think a critical role in both enabling and encouraging that type of integrated management. And for the reasons I mentioned earlier, the federal government has reasons why it should want to play a major role in improving water management in the United States. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be there in person with you today. I hope you've at least enjoyed seeing the creek in the background during my presentation. And I hope in a few moments that I'll be able to answer your questions by telephone. Thank you very much.